Section 2. Apostasy. Chapter 5. Cain and Abel Tested. This chapter is based on Genesis 4, 1-15. Cain and Abel, the sons of Adam, differed widely in character. Abel had a spirit of loyalty to God. He saw justice and mercy in the Creator's dealings with the fallen race, and gratefully accepted the hope of redemption. But Cain cherished feelings of rebellion, and murmured against God because of the curse pronounced upon the earth, and upon the human race for Adam's sin. He permitted his mind to run in the same channel that led to Satan's fall, indulging the desire for self-exaltation, and questioning the divine justice and authority. These brothers were tested, as Adam had been tested before them, to prove whether they would believe and obey the word of God. They were acquainted with the provision made for the salvation of man, and understood the system of offerings which God had ordained. They knew that in these offerings they were to express faith in the Savior whom the offerings typified, and at the same time to acknowledge their total dependence on Him for pardon. And they knew that by thus conforming to the divine plan for their redemption, they were giving proof of their obedience to the will of God. Without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission of sin. And they were to show their faith in the blood of Christ as the promised atonement by offering the firstlings of the flock in sacrifice. Besides this, the first fruits of the earth were to be presented before the Lord as a thank offering. The two brothers erected their altars alike, and each brought an offering. Abel presented a sacrifice from the flock, in accordance with the Lord's directions. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Fire flashed from heaven and consumed the sacrifice. But Cain, disregarding the Lord's direct and explicit command, presented only an offering of fruit. There was no token from heaven to show that it was accepted. Abel pleaded with his brother to approach God in the divinely prescribed way, but his entreaties only made Cain the more determined to follow his own will. As the eldest, he felt above being admonished by his brother and despised his counsel. Cain came before God with murmuring and infidelity in his heart in regard to the promised sacrifice and the necessity of the sacrificial offerings. His gift expressed no penitence for sin. He felt, as many now feel, that it would be an acknowledgment of weakness to follow the exact plan marked out by God of trusting His salvation wholly to the atonement of the promised Savior. He chose the course of self-dependence. He would come in His own merits. He would not bring the Lamb and mingle its blood with His offering, but would present His fruits, the products of His labor. He presented His offering as a favor done to God, through which He expected to secure the divine approval. Cain obeyed in building an altar, obeyed in bringing a sacrifice, but he rendered only a partial obedience. The essential part, the recognition of the need of a Redeemer, was left out. So far as birth and religious instruction were concerned, these brothers were equal. Both were sinners, and both acknowledged the claims of God to reverence and worship. To outward appearance, their religion was the same up to a certain point. But beyond this, the difference between the two was great. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. Abel grasped the great principles of redemption. He saw himself a sinner, and he saw sin and its penalty, death, standing between his soul and communion with God. He brought the slain victim and sacrificed life, thus acknowledging the claims of the law that had been transgressed. Through the shed blood he looked to the future sacrifice, Christ dying on the cross of Calvary, and trusting in the atonement that was there to be made, he had the witness that he was righteous, and his offering accepted. Cain had the same opportunity of learning and accepting these truths as had Abel, he was not the victim of an arbitrary purpose. One brother was not elected to be accepted of God and the other to be rejected. Abel chose faith and obedience. 
Cain, unbelief and rebellion. Here the whole matter rested. Cain and Abel represent two classes that will exist in the world till the close of time. One class avail themselves of the appointed sacrifice for sin. The other venture to depend upon their own merits. Theirs is a sacrifice without the virtue of divine mediation, and thus it is not able to bring man into favor with God. It is only through the merits of Jesus that our transgressions can be pardoned. Those who feel no need of the blood of Christ, who feel that without divine grace they can by their own works secure the approval of God, are making the same mistake as did Cain. If they do not accept the cleansing blood, they are under condemnation. There is no other provision made whereby they can be released from the thraldom of sin. The class of worshipers who follow the example of Cain includes by far the greater portion of the world, for nearly every false religion has been based on the same principle, that man can depend upon his own efforts for salvation. It is claimed by some that the human race is in need, not of redemption, but of development, that it can refine, elevate, and regenerate itself. As Cain thought to secure the divine favor by an offering that lacked the blood of a sacrifice, so do these expect to exalt humanity to the divine standard, independent of the atonement. The history of Cain shows what must be the result. It shows what man will become apart from Christ. Humanity has no power to regenerate itself. It does not tend upward toward the divine, but downward toward the satanic. Christ is our only hope. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Neither is there salvation in any other. Acts chapter 4 verse 12. True faith which relies wholly upon Christ will be manifested by obedience to all the requirements of God. From Adam's day to the present time the great controversy has been concerning obedience to God's law. In all ages there have been those who claimed a right to the favor of God even while they were disregarding some of His commands. But the Scriptures declare that by works is faith made perfect, and that without the works of obedience faith is dead. James chapter 2, verses 22 and 17. He that professes to know God and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. 1 John chapter 2, verse 4. When Cain saw that his offering was rejected, he was angry with the Lord and with Abel. He was angry that God did not accept man's substitute in place of the sacrifice divinely ordained, and angry with his brother for choosing to obey God instead of joining in rebellion against him. Notwithstanding Cain's disregard of the divine command, God did not leave him to himself. But he condescended to reason with the man who had shown himself so unreasonable. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? Through an angel messenger the divine warning was conveyed, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. The choice lay with Cain himself. If he would trust to the merits of the promised Savior and would obey God's requirements, he would enjoy his favor. But should he persist in unbelief and transgression, he would have no ground for complaint because he was rejected by the Lord. But instead of acknowledging his sin, Cain continued to complain of the injustice of God and to cherish jealousy and hatred of Abel. He angrily reproached his brother and attempted to draw him into controversy concerning God's dealings with them. In meekness, yet fearlessly and firmly, Abel defended the justice and goodness of God. He pointed out Cain's error and tried to convince him that the wrong was in himself. He pointed to the compassion of God in sparing the life of their parents when he might have punished them with instant death and urged that God loved them, or he would not have given his son, innocent and holy, to suffer the penalty which they had incurred. All this caused Cain's anger to burn the hotter. Reason and conscience told him that Abel was in the right, 
but he was enraged that one who had been wont to heed his counsel should now presume to disagree with him, and that he could gain no sympathy in his rebellion. In the fury of his passion he slew his brother. Cain hated and killed his brother, not for any wrong that Abel had done, but because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. 1 John chapter 3, verse 12. So in all ages the wicked have hated those who were better than themselves. Abel's life of obedience and unswerving faith was to Cain a perpetual reproof. Every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. John chapter 3, verse 20. The brighter the heavenly light that is reflected from the character of God's faithful servants, the more clearly the sins of the ungodly are revealed, and the more determined will be their efforts to destroy those who disturb their peace. The murder of Abel was the first example of the enmity that God had declared would exist between the serpent and the seed of the woman, between Satan and his subjects, and Christ and his followers. Through man's sin, Satan had gained control of the human race, but Christ would enable them to cast off his yoke. Whenever through faith in the Lamb of God a soul renounces the service of sin, Satan's wrath is kindled. The holy life of Abel testified against Satan's claim that it is impossible for man to keep God's law. When Cain, moved by the spirit of the wicked one, saw that he could not control Abel, he was so enraged that he destroyed his life. And wherever there are any who will stand in vindication of the righteousness of the law of God, the same spirit will be manifested against them. It is the spirit that through all the ages has set up the stake and kindled the burning pile for the disciples of Christ. But the cruelties heaped upon the follower of Jesus was instigated by Satan and his hosts because they cannot force him to submit to their control. It is the rage of a vanquished foe. Every martyr of Jesus has died a conqueror, says the prophet, they overcame him, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Revelation chapter 12, verses 11 and 9. Cain the murderer was soon called to answer for his crime. The Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Cain had gone so far in sin that he had lost a sense of the continual presence of God and of his greatness and omniscience. So he resorted to falsehood to conceal his guilt. Again the Lord said to Cain, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. God had given Cain an opportunity to confess his sin. He had had time to reflect. He knew the enormity of the deed he had done and of the falsehood he had uttered to conceal it. But he was rebellious still, and the sentence was no longer deferred. The divine voice that had been heard in entreaty and admonition pronounced the terrible words, And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. Notwithstanding that Cain had by his crimes merited the sentence of death, a merciful Creator still spared his life and granted him opportunity for repentance. But Cain lived only to harden his heart, to encourage rebellion against the divine authority, and to become the head of a line of bold, abandoned sinners. This one apostate, led on by Satan, became a tempter to others, and his example and influence exerted their demoralizing power until the earth became so corrupt and filled with violence as to call for its destruction. In sparing the life of the first murderer, God presented before the whole universe a lesson bearing upon the great controversy. The dark history of Cain and his descendants was an illustration of what would have been the result of permitting the sinner to live on forever, to carry out his rebellion against God. The forbearance of God only rendered the wicked more bold and defiant in their iniquity. 
Fifteen centuries after the sentence pronounced upon Cain, the universe witnessed the fruition of his influence and example in the crime and pollution that flooded the earth. It was made manifest that the sentence of death pronounced upon the fallen race for the transgression of God's law was both just and merciful. The longer men lived in sin, the more abandoned they became. The divine sentence cutting short a career of unbridled iniquity and freeing the world from the influence of those who had become hardened in rebellion was a blessing rather than a curse. Satan is constantly at work, with intense energy and under a thousand disguises, to misrepresent the character and government of God. With extensive, well-organized plans and marvelous power, he is working to hold the inhabitants of the world under his deceptions. God, the one infinite and all-wise, sees the end from the beginning, and in dealing with evil, his plans were far-reaching and comprehensive. It was his purpose not merely to put down the rebellion, but to demonstrate to all the universe the nature of the rebellion. God's plan was unfolding, showing both his justice and his mercy, and fully vindicating his wisdom and righteousness in his dealings with evil. The holy inhabitants of other worlds were watching with the deepest interest the events taking place on the earth. In the condition of the world that existed before the flood, they saw illustrated the results of the administration which Lucifer had endeavored to establish in heaven in rejecting the authority of Christ and casting aside the law of God. In those high-handed sinners of the antediluvian world, they saw the subjects over whom Satan held sway. The thoughts of men's hearts were only evil continually. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. Every emotion... Every impulse and imagination was at war with the divine principles of purity and peace and love. It was an example of the awful depravity resulting from Satan's policy to remove from God's creatures the restraint of his holy law. By the facts unfolded in the progress of the great controversy, God will demonstrate the principles of his rules of government, which have been falsified by Satan and by all whom he has deceived. His justice will finally be acknowledged by the whole world, though the acknowledgment will be made too late to save the rebellious. God carries with him the sympathy and approval of the whole universe as step by step his great plan advances to its complete fulfillment. He will carry it with him in the final eradication of rebellion. It will be seen that all who have forsaken the divine precepts have placed themselves on the side of Satan in warfare against Christ. When the prince of this world shall be judged, and all who have united with him shall share his fate, the whole universe as witnesses to the sentence will declare, Just and true are thy ways, thou king of saints. Revelation chapter 15, verse 3.